the entire maternal newborn experience begins with a process that introduces every adolescent girl to womanhood, the menstrual cycle. Ranging anywhere from 21 to 36 days, with an average of 28 days, the menstrual cycle is a series of hormonal changes that, in essence, brings the ovum or egg to maturity and renews the uterine tissue bed to promote growth should the ovum be fertilized. When fertilization does not take place, the ovum, along with the blood, mucus, and endometrial tissue, is shed during menses or menstruation, a process that varies in length from one to eight days. The first day of the menses marks the beginning of a new menstrual cycle. Hormonally speaking, the menstrual cycle is actually two simultaneous cycles, each with its own distinct hormonal phases. The ovarian cycle comprises the follicular, ovulatory, and luteal phases. Beginning with the first day of menses and in a 28-day cycle, ending about 14 days later, the follicular phase spans the time it takes for an ovum to mature. The drop in estrogen and progesterone levels just prior to menstruation stimulates the anterior pituitary to produce follicle-stimulating hormone, or FSH, and luteinizing hormone, or LH, during this phase. These hormones spark the growth of several graphene follicles, each containing an immature ovum. One of these follicles matures and releases high levels of estrogen, which in turn suppresses FSH secretion and blocks maturation of other follicles. Next is the ovulatory phase, during which surges in FSH and LH cause a slight fall in estrogen production and a rise in progesterone secretion, triggering the final maturation and release of the ovum. The final segment is the luteal phase, during which the now eggless follicle, called the corpus luteum, secretes estrogen and progesterone to prepare the endometrium to receive the fertilized ovum. With fertilization, another hormone, human chorionic gonadotropin, or HCG, is secreted, and the corpus luteum remains through the early pregnancy. Without fertilization, FSH and LH levels drop. The corpus luteum regresses and no longer produces high levels of estrogen and progesterone. Menstruation follows, and the entire cycle begins again. The endometrial cycle describes the response of the uterine lining to the hormonal changes of the menstrual cycle. Corresponding to the first half of the menstrual cycle, the proliferative phase reflects the time it takes for the thin endometrium that remains after menses to thicken. During the secretory phase, the endometrium continues to prepare for fertilization, secreting various substances to nourish the fertilized ovum. When the egg is not fertilized, the menstrual phase follows, during which endometrial cells become ischemic and necrotic and are shed during menses. Most women experience some degree of discomfort during menstruation, such as pelvic and back pain, often called cramps, along with breast tenderness and fatigue. Therapeutic management is basically self-care. Over-the-counter analgesics, such as ibuprofen, usually relieve menstrual discomfort. Uterine cramping appears to be initiated by the body's release of prostaglandins. And since ibuprofen seems to have prostaglandin inhibiting properties, it is a good choice for relieving menstrual pain. A heating pad on the abdomen and lower back can also help relieve cramping and backache, as the heat will increase blood flow to the area and promote relaxation. Relaxation sometimes helps. However, exercise is also an effective therapy for menstrual discomfort. Menstrual irregularity is quite common among adolescent and teens, both in duration and manifestation. Menstrual flow is sometimes quite heavy, requiring frequent changing of pads or tampons. And by the way, although we've learned a great deal about toxic shock syndrome, since it was believed that tampon use directly caused it, it is still a good idea to change tampons every four hours, and preferably every two to three hours. As for discomfort, most teens experience mild cramping. 
but for those who have severe cramping that is not relieved by medication, a gynecologic examination is recommended. Let's take a look at a situation you could easily encounter with a teenager. How would you respond to her questions? Here's the situation. A 15-year-old girl says that her periods are really bad. She states, they're so irregular, sometimes every 24 or 25 days, sometimes as long as 32 days apart. They are heavy too. I change my tampons frequently and I usually have cramps. What should you tell your client? What you're experiencing is not unusual at all. In fact, you might need to change tampons even more often than every two to three hours. You might need to call your doctor right away. I'll need a little more information about your cycles and bleeding. Or, if I were you, I would take up running. A little exercise would be good for you. The answer is A. What she is experiencing is within normal limits. It is common for teenagers to have irregular cycles. The cramps, too, are normal and usually indicate ovulatory cycles. So reassure her that it is unlikely that anything is wrong. You could certainly suggest daily aerobic exercise such as swimming or walking, but you would not be cavalier about the situation, as in D. Other helpful recommendations would be to use a heating pad for discomfort and to take ibuprofen. Also associated with the menstrual cycle is premenstrual syndrome, called PMS. Symptoms include headache, bloating, heaviness in the lower abdomen and legs, tenderness and swelling of the breasts, food cravings, depression, and irritability. Another menstrual variation is amenorrhea, or absence of menses. Of course, this is expected with pregnancy and menopause, but it can also be a consequence of anorexia, excessive exercise, a pathological process in the reproductive tract, or a metabolic disorder. Dysmenorrhea, another variation, is severe abdominal and lower back pain with menses, sometimes accompanied by nausea and vomiting. Various reproductive tract disorders can cause this painful condition. So, as we know, the menstrual cycle prepares a woman's body for pregnancy. The next step is conception, the fertilization of the female ovum or egg by a male spermatozoan or sperm. The sperm enters the ovum and the nuclei unite forming a zygote. The ovum is receptive to fertilization for about 10 to 24 hours after release from the ovary, while sperm remain viable for 24 to 72 hours after ejaculation. Fertilization usually takes place in the distal third of the fallopian tube. After fertilization, the zygote divides into multiple cells. Meanwhile, it is traveling into the uterus where it will burrow into the innermost segment of the endometrium, a process called implantation. About a week after ovulation, the fertilized ovum has exceeded 100 cells, at which time it is known as a blastocyst. It continues to undergo growth and differentiation, eventually becoming a fetus about eight weeks after fertilization. The process we've described so far, from the point of conception onward, is of course the initial phase of pregnancy, the time between conception and birth. The total length of time from conception to birth is called gestation, typically 280 days or 40 weeks. Nagel's rule is the most commonly used formula for calculating the estimated date of confinement, or EDC, also called the due date. Starting with the first day of the client's last menstrual period, or LMP, then moving forward seven days and counting back three months, you will arrive at the client's EDC. Now, for example, if the LMP was January 17th, add seven days. This should be January 24th. Then subtract three months and you will have October 24th. This is the client's estimated date of confinement. 